Hola, buenas tardes. Es para mí un placer volver a estar en este salón de actos de nuevo con un ciclo del Departamento de Proyectos Arquitectónicos que, como siempre, ha hecho una apuesta eh, por las jóvenes generaciones del departamento. Ya sabemos que las jóvenes generaciones tienen treinta y pico y en algún caso casi cuarenta. Pero en este caso son las jóvenes generaciones del departamento y de la escuela. Eh, estoy muy contento de eh, tener a Piet Ecker, eh, Argument 2, eh, que es el, el nombre del nuevo ciclo, está jugando con la práctica dual que es una práctica dual que a mí me parece extremadamente recomendable para todo el profesorado de esta escuela y que probablemente alguien me matará por decirlo. Pero me parece maravilloso que la gente enseñe y tenga práctica profesional eh, al mismo tiempo. Y esa enseñanza y esa práctica profesional y confrontar eh, las dos es de lo que va a tratar eh, este ciclo. Eh, tenemos a Silvia Colmenares, subdirectora del departamento, a quien le daré la palabra ahora. Eh, Ferna, eh, Andrés Cánova, su director, se excusó con nosotros diciendo que no podía, no estaba en Madrid, está probablemente en la Bienal oyendo eh, a Venecia en estos momentos, supongo. Eh, y eh, tenemos eh, también a los comisarios eh, de este ciclo, a Pablo Oriol, a Fernando Rodríguez, a Fernando Pino y a Juan Elvira. Espero no haberme dejado a nadie dentro de la historia. Habéis visto que hay publicidad del, eh, del eh, programa en el pabellón nuevo, eh, justamente en la entrada, e igual que se estará anunciando todos los distintos programas eh, del ciclo. Curiosamente, eh, para que los que no puedan dejar de ver a Piedecker otra vez más, lo podremos volver a ver el lunes por la mañana, yo creo que es de las cosas más divertidas que me han pasado. Yo esta mañana me he sentido en el Día de la Marmota cuando me han invitado a presentar a Pierre Ecker en una conferencia de la Cátedra Blanca el lunes a las doce y media y he dicho, a ver, no era, eh, no era esta noche a las siete de la tarde, pero está muy bien porque en esta escuela, que somos cinco mil personas, eh, hay eh, público en todo momento y en todos los horarios y en todas las historias. Silvia... Enhorabuena al departamento una vez más por a montar ti, ti también siempre, esto y por contribuir tanto a la vida, a la vida cultural y a la vida de la escuela y a entender cómo la escuela eh, se entiende con otras universidades, en este caso Mendricio, aunque Pitt creo que ha estado absolutamente en todas partes, aparte de Mendricio. Te dejo la palabra. Gracias. Bueno, nada, mi, mi, mi papel aquí es simplemente, bueno, en nombre del departamento, daros la bienvenida, daros también las gracias por eh, sí. lo que es una asistencia bastante considerable. Eh, hoy arrancamos este ciclo, bueno, gracias Manuel, sobre todo de verdad por estar aquí, que sabemos que tu agenda es muy apretada y que, y que te agradecemos mucho que apoyes esta iniciativa del departamento. Como sabéis, eh, eh, iniciamos esta aventura de Argument eh, el año pasado. Se, trata de, se trataba de dar un poco un sentido a mm, todas estas invitaciones que hacíamos y el ciclo de conferencias de, de organizados del departamento eh, pudiera tener un hilo conductor eh, y para eso eh, pues, eh, montamos eh, este programa que eh, a lo mejor vosotros no lo sabéis, pero es una convocatoria abierta entre los profesores del departamento que tienen que eh, hacernos una propuesta. ¿no? Y en este caso, eh, el equipo, el año pasado sabéis que se llamaba Sampling Context, muchos de los que estáis aquí seguramente eh, asististeis a las conferencias. Y, y este año, eh, bueno, pues eh, ya los ha presentado eh, Manuel, pero son cuatro profesores del departamento que tienen eh, unos intereses comunes y que han sido capaces de poner encima de la mesa este argumento que os van a explicar y que han bautizado como Dual Practices, que es algo que yo creo que es muy pertinente en esta escuela. Creo que no se me ha estado oyendo nada hasta ahora mismo. Ah, vale, vale. Bueno, gracias a todos y os, os dejo con ellos, que son los, realmente los, los protagonistas hoy. Bueno, y por último, para que no sea como muy aburrido antes de que podamos eh, tener a nuestro invitado, yo voy a cambiar directamente al inglés para, para que podamos escucharle a él ya con el oído un poco eh, entrenado. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Pete Eckert. Um, as Silvia said, this, this uh, 
uh, idea of dual practices is clearly linked to something that is happening, has been uh, a main theme in our school, this idea of, of the link of, of academia uh, and, and thought and, and thought of architecture with the practice of architecture, the, the fact of making it, actually, of building. Uh, we are celebrating uh, Oitha's uh, um, 10 years, uh, 100 years, and uh, it's clearly an example of this. And it's always been linked with, uh, with our school. We wanted to just see how this could happen uh, with other schools in, in Europe, this link. Where could we find this link, uh, powerful link, between practice and academia in other schools, in other beautiful schools, uh, powerful schools, and uh, also, uh, like nice and, and uh, uh, well makers uh, of, of the architecture around in the scene of, of the European uh, profession. So uh, we invited to start this uh, Pete Eckert, uh, who along with uh, Wim, his brother, uh, ran the office E2A in Zurich uh, from 2001. I guess, and uh, they also teach together in Mendrisio, uh, in the Academia di Architettura, uh, as guest uh, professors, and uh, we just felt that they were clearly one of the more powerful examples of this dual practice uh, that we wanted to show you. Uh, they worked before uh, uh, establishing their office in Zurich for OMA, and, uh, and they were having different uh, uh, kinds of, of practices uh, in the city of Zurich before establishing their own practice and, and winning uh, some competitions that pushed up their practice uh, in the first years of, of this uh, century. And you already know probably their work for the many monographs and, uh, and uh, uh, publications in which they are uh, published, okay, and uh, there's probably something interesting that we will see, and it's about uh, this idea of linking uh, like some kind of idealism with a powerful realism in their proposals. So, Pete, please uh, just join us, and the word to you. So, thank you very much for this uh, invitation uh, and thank you very much for this absolutely warm uh, reception here at the ETSAM, which is, uh, it's great to be here. I thought that this invitation to talk about um, the dual practice or this pivoting relationship between what we're trying to aim for as a teacher and what we're trying to aim as a uh, practicing architect uh, was a very seducing format of a lecture. And, um, and um, so I'm, I'm trying really to, to um, elaborate on these pivoting uh, conditions of the two disciplines within the domain of architecture. I, I start with a film scene, and actually this is a scene from Fountainhead, uh, uh, done by King Vidder uh, quite some years ago. And it says in the scene, we want you to adapt your building like this. Now, I'm using this to kind of elaborate that within the presentation of this project in that mo movie, the client, so to speak, invades the idea of the modernist architecture and juxtapose a kind of a classicist porticus or a classicist uh, uh, um, socle or base uh, to this architecture. And we, our, I, I use this scene because we, we have, let's say, or we have been taught by a generation of architects in Switzerland that were exposed to a very uh, patronal system or where the position of an architecture or of an architect itself was very strong, culturally founded, 
And we experienced in the last 20 years how the systematics and the economy and the market economy really um, changed, let's say, the position of the architecture in society, but also within uh, the market itself as what, what the possibilities were. So, um, and let's say uh, the idea that constraints and difficulties and um, uh, let's say forces that that uh, are all circumstances the architecture become very complex today you could also say that architecture is very vulnerable as a discipline because you you you're depending on so many today and uh, the question is, for us as, as architects that want to practice, but also architects that want to teach, how do we anticipate with our course, or how do we anticipate with this issue about the weakening of the discipline itself, and how can we be creative or artistic uh, in, in response uh, to, to that? So we, my brother and me, we, we trying to, or we try to kind of formulate a strategy that not only is being concentrating or that has been concentrated uh, on, on the idea how we could practice, but also how we could actually teach. And we, we formed a studio in Mentrisio that was, that was very much dealing with the idea of a strategic architecture. So what, what is that? So let's do some uh, statements. So architecture may react on the context that is increasingly driven by the massive impact of social, political, and economic and ecological factors, attempting to maintain a singular sense of cohesion. Now, the idea of cohesion was very much based in the Swiss culture of the architecture, very much based in the mind of our teachers that an architecture had to be, or had to deal with a cohesive, uh, with a condition to bring things all together. But now, you can say the contemporary condition, the, contemporary, the, the contradictory, has become the contemporary program of our discipline. So you can say, while we've been trained to think about cohesion, the contemporary condition has eroded the, the circumstance to be or to develop a cohesive uh, condition. So uh, this is a contradictory condition or this is, a, this is a discrepancy. How can we deal with this? And we thought that, that we wanted to introduce a strategic uh, organization of space that, that uh, um, is one that, that actually mixes elements or a strategy that, is, uh, that allows us to mix a, a value system and action logics. You could say it, it opens up a combination of essential incoherences. So the target of strat strategic architecture is to manage the coexistence of uh, conflicting values. So we try to shift in our own idea, uh, the, the imagination of cohesion, and we try to deal maybe with an um, a, a, a idea of how we combine different values. So the result, going to the university and going to uh, teach, uh, is that, um, that we were very much interested in methodologies. Uh, uh, so the stra strategic ideas that could actually be uh, transformed into a kind of idea of methodologies that uh, um, allows us not to, to bring the know-how or the experience of the practice into the school in the sense to create a pseudo uh, practice in the school. That's what we absolutely did not want to do but to actually examining methodologies for our own sense uh, of our own development of the architecture as well as in a very artistic way uh, in school. And then actually using this, 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 uh, this um, relationship uh, to examine, to discover, so to speak. So you can also say to teach 
is not only to teach architecture, but it's also to learn from your students. And in, in, and in this way, I, I thought it was kind of very important to, to um, rediscover ideas of, on methodologies. I've been asked to show a number of exercises, and I, I'm, of course we do uh, this in a more general sense because one exercise in itself would limit the discussion a bit, but I think I'm, I'm trying to give you an overview how we introduce that aspect on methodologies in, in our studio. So we, we formulated an idea of exercises that we say combining singularities. Now you remember, I said that, that our teachers were very much into cohesion, and nowadays uh, this idea of cohesion is, is kind of eroded, and the idea how you eventually could combine different singularities, this became a very, let's say, contemporary and a very interesting uh, uh, idea to, to react on, let's say, the contemporary condition. So it is the aim and the intention of our studio to investigate the formal and spatial generative possibilities when the notion of hybridization is applied. The combination of multiple architectural condition within a single system inherently challenge the conventional view of a building identity and our notion and understanding of autonomous types. It could be seen as a tool to elaborate a specific combination of program, structure, typologies in order to deal with the discrepancies or in other words, to systemize these found incoherencies. So mixing, assembling, arranging, composing diverse identity in order to obtain a new singularity, this was a kind of the first scope, the first years in Mendrisio where we tried to examine these procedures and methodologies that were actually able to produce these, these ideas. Um, it was, of course, also very interesting that uh, very early Hugh Ferris uh, in, in his uh, uh, um, publications uh, developed this kind of almost mythical uh, representation about the metropolis or the metropolitan condition. And most of the developments he used, he combined uh, unbelievably gifted uh, fundamental different types of, of architectural uh, uh, spaces, so almost the clerical, in this case, for example, the, how the clerical type or clerical typology of space can, can be combined with a moment of high rises or moment of neoliberalism of, a, of awakening uh, American uh, Manhattanism in, in New York. Uh, so we found this a very inspiring a key image of the studio, how to study combinations, mixing, and relations. It's one of our preferred artists, uh, Yusovic, uh, which with very clever manipulations is really able to give um, an object a total different twist of its origin. You know, so this moment where he starts to combine, manipulating uh, um, a, a condition or an object that you still obviously are able to recognize, but the moment uh, he kind of alienates it, mixes it, changes or manipulates it, it becomes a kind of an ambiguous body that uh, um, is, is, let's say, retrieving his idea about the straight usage or functionality. So this we're trying to examine with our students and uh, developed uh, exercises which we called dual body. It's interesting, so it's not about the studio and architecture or the practicing, but it's about a body that has this capacity to being two things at the same time. So that kind of dissolute 
to some extent, its own clarity of the one thing. You can say it's an ambiguous project or to how to create a, a ambiguity. So every team of two students must focus on the production of a concept model, which is to emerge from uh, the combination uh, of, of different architectural typologies by producing a conceptual model as instrument of investigation. Each team will try to exemplify a specific condition of hybridity and interdependency. So it's another great work of an artist which we admire, which is Jupp van Lieshout. So this, this, this uh, unbelievable combination of cave and crib, so to speak, or you can say prison, control, and uh, uh, the first bet of a human, uh, creates exactly this, this tension or this relation that we were searching. So we did many exercises. I'm trying to kind of extrapolish maybe a few ones just to uh, highlight uh, how the students actually reacted to it, and uh, we called it this exercise one to kind of work yourself into a topic without the preconcession or without the repertoire which you have learned so far. So it's a kind of discovery mode, so to speak. So to combine these two objects where it becomes a kind of an independent shower, the way actually it's being connected, the way that the one and the other is manipulating its original function, we were interested to, let's say, create the sensitivity among our students uh, how an object or how a behavior could be studied without the obligation to be too early exposed to an architectural language. Um, Another example, which I found the, at the time very intriguing, and the question is always, if you do this exercise, what holds it together? How is it actually related? And the student find out that there are many different objects that have absolutely the same radial conditions, and just by meeting the same radius at the point, it kind of transcends, basically, the building, uh, it transcends the original uh, aspiration of the object and uh, it gets a complete new object that is similar to the art uh, examples that I've showed, um, effectively broadens the idea of what it actually is and how it eventually could work. So from a dual relationship, we shifted the next step and which became a kind of a second, almost a consecutive exercise. And we, we called it then the architectural body. And uh, so the discovery was supposed to be translated into an architectural cultivated language uh, that then would uh, deliver uh, basically the... Um, the discovery that uh, a student has done uh, by, by the previous exercises. Uh, for me, this was almost an autobiographical example because this, the image is uh, Vincent de Rake's workshop. This was the workshop where all the models at, from OMA in the 90s were produced. And this is the assembly of a kind of iconic architectural model, uh, which is the uh, concept model of the Bibliot Très Grand Bibliothèque in Paris, before it actually got assembled. You know, so it uh, rather looks like a bakery, or it looks something completely different. And the question now is, how do you connect? How do you relate this into a kind of an architectural body? So there. Uh, students, of course, were liberated uh, from a kind of a st style or from an expression and some examples about uh, these uh, uh, early efforts, you could say, um, to enter a language of uh, a model that is not necessarily anymore uh, or that, doesn't, uh, that does not aspire to, to explain the project in its uh, entity, but actually tries to um, um, uh, describe basically the, the 
primary interest uh, of the authors, what they were aiming for and what they were intending uh, to relate to each other. So uh, I found this a very interesting example because you could imagine a entire other building around. Uh, you could think maybe that was the building or that was only a kind of a core structure vis-a-vis -vis a invisible shell. So, so many things actually were explorable through these exercises and maybe it enlightens why the, the stressing or why the importance of introducing methodologies back into this scheme of, of uh, uh, architectural teaching um, um, was so important for us uh, because we could actually learn and test different methodologies that were generated, so to speak, out of an artistic approach from our students. Many others, this is a different structural model where the different grains and the different um, grids, so to speak, uh, speak for different spans, for different operations. Uh, within one system, uh, how they would actually uh, formulate a, a hybrid intervention on a, on a uh, structural idea of the building. Even in a very bold way, and that's why I'm trying to give you quite a, quite a, 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 a large horizon about uh, these uh, early uh, uh, works uh, by students on that, on that, uh, 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 on that matter, uh, even if it's a bold expression of um, uh, an, a volume that has, on on first sight, not necessarily a clarity, but on on a on a second take, so to speak, uh, speaks as a as a, a operation of of merging or juxtaposing or relating to to it. This this was. Um, uh, a kind of interesting. Now, what do we do with this? And uh, what we wanted is that through the exploration of it, we are not getting stuck with the context on a, on a very early basis. So we have an architectural idea with the student now, and we actually come back with this architectural idea and trying to engage the context. This was a kind of a larger work with uh, the, the interesting fact of the, the dual uh, uh, aspect of practicing and teaching is also that um, it's not only the teacher that has an experience between practicing and teaching, but it's also founding and searching for partners that are actually also helping us in this process. And we have found out that cities are very interesting partners to, to think about this dual relationship because everything that the city has no money or everything that the city has no real courage to think about, we can think about at the academia. And this test laboratory, or you can say this idea of academia, to bring a idea back to, let's say, the, the responsible directors of urban planning was a very interesting experience because the project were not asked to be, uh, were not asked to, to, to have a kind of a reality check, but actually to exactly examine some of the ideas that were linked to the context. So the city actually be, became a partner of our studio in Mendrisio. Uh, to examine basically the conditions that the students were elaborating. Now we called it, of course, it was an implementation work, so how can now architectural work be implemented into a continuous site? This was a very large urban district and we were less interested in the master planning, but more about how this uh, development of hybridization could now deliver a context to a site that the, the city has had absolutely no idea about it. And for those of you that have been in Zurich, um, this uh, is a very atypical 
uh, expression of space in, 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 in Zurich. So this is very rare. This is large, a large area. This is a large area uh, full of infrastructure, but with absolutely zero vitality and urban quality. So this is very rare. And this also documents the, the lack of idea of our partner to actually think how infrastructure can be engaged with an architectural program. So you see how we start to construct. We have an exercise where you think about hybridization, where, let's say, a discovery is being transferred into an architectural body, into an architectural relation. And we have a site, actually, that almost speaks of it in a very similar way, that there's a lot of uh, infrastructure, but there's very little of architecture in it. So how can we combine, mix, relate? So this is exactly now how the methodology connects to a site. So every student uh, got the site along this, um, this long area. And I'm going to show you quickly three projects um, that we found very interesting. The one is in the foreground, which was a kind of a triangular trapezoid building and that, that could actually bear a, a very large sockle or base and a very thin layer. You see how thin the proportion is uh, of houses or housing uh, on top of it. And then further back, a project that we will also quickly see more in detail, which is how a market idea could be combined with a housing idea. And then in the far background, a very thin finger or high-rise building uh, where actually the students combined an industrial factory with a high-rise type. So you see these combinatorial approaches, how things come together, were really examined in large models. So we forced them to build very big models so that architecture really is a part of the production. So it's not that there's a top-down, a master plan, but there is a configuration, a geometry, a proportion, a idea about facade uh, in this um, uh, development of the model. Another example how these differences of structural devices start with a very broad system, a system that embeds an industrial factory actually at that site, um, and then how it could evolve into um, very, let's say, slender or slim towers of housing. So this, this insinuation, how things come together, we were really uh, interested uh, in it uh, as, a, as a methodological aspect in it to, to learn from this, this uh, causal relationships, you know, of, of having the one and the other, but in the end, uh, in a project like this, you cannot take one thing off anymore. It's really relating to each other. I found this, uh, and you see the similarity, of course. I found this project, of course, was, was uh, very successful, the way that the type of space of a market, a food market, which was based on the contextual reading uh, of the large uh, infrastructure there, was based to, together with a, with a type of a housing and was almost invading or collapsing or uh, relating to it. This was the long view in it. So it's a kind of a very radical, ambiguous uh, project by students that followed a methodology to to target this, this hybridization in, in projects. And for us, this aspect of methodology was not that we always have the same method. Just get that, uh, please, right. So what our idea was that students were able to design a methodologies to conceive, basically, exactly this uh, idea of uh, the target. So you see the plans, how absolutely different regions or different domains, so to speak, uh, merge with each other, how they get in contact and how they are uh, isolating itself again. So we, we uh, have, of course, a debate, and the debate is also related to our guests, similar to you. Um, and this, this discussion, basically, of 
how the typological experiences um, can be, let's say, seen further was the target of our uh, final review in Mendricio. So I'm not going to read this, don't worry, but what I'm going to try to say is like this was a kind of important step for us because we knew that we could react with different ambitions in one project uh, and this was a, in a way a, a discovery that uh, we have made through these uh, moments of, of uh, uh, studies at the university. And to, to make it short here, the methodology that is linked is, has this kind of early um, idea of body and plan, how things come together, and it has a different next step that works with typology and implementation. And then the third condition is the composed image. And basically, till today, we work very explicitly with this three-step plan because it delivers an aspiration, so to speak. You can say it delivers an ambition to connect. It kind of uh, introduces the, the architectural um, making, how you combine the typologies and how you implement it into the context, and the way you develop the image as an idea of composed image, which means that we basically uh, search for narratives in the image, search for historical moments where we can learn and build into our uh, um, uh, uh, images. So the model became clearly one of the kind of front runners uh, uh, of the studio and it helped of course that Minterizio is very much uh, um, um, organized like an art school um, the school itself is not a technical university, uh, has a different curriculum in that sense. It's really an art school and it's the only art school in Switzerland to study architecture. Yeah? So the classical curriculum is really the one of the ETH, which is, an, uh, which is a uh, technical university. And the, the, the art school sort of delivers maybe in in, 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 in contrast or maybe in, in the discussion about that, more these, these explorations uh, uh, on methodology rather than technology. And so the model became a kind of a absolutely key development of our own uh, exploration. The way that collages and uh, uh, projects uh, are being described, so the students were asked to not only explore their models, but to find in history similar conditions that we can learn from. Uh, this is a staircase by Egon Eiermann. Egon Eiermann was one of the German heroes of modernist architecture. I think is, I think one of the most interesting architects uh, in Germany uh, ever. Um, and uh, students actually learned how to implement some of these uh, moments that uh, Eiermann actually designed and, and they embedded it in their own perspective, so to speak. So it is like an image that is related to a kind of history or an image that is related to a kind of a content. And that's what we mean with the idea of narrative. And of course, the last techniques or the last step was the plan. So it, it kind of concludes in the project of the body, the project of the image, and the project of the plan itself, which then, of course, the plan is the great discipline of organization, it's the great discipline of how to organize spaces and cultivate geometry. So, um, this is the, the, the extraordinary, I think, condition of, of this dual practice that you start to teach um, your, your studio exactly in this destillated version. And the next year, that, or the, the year that we have then followed in Mendrisio, uh, we, we destillated exactly this methodology. We tried to reduce it maybe. And this gives you an impact or an impression how quickly you can understand the project. Now, this was an urban project in Berlin. 
It is the model, it's clearly clear what the model wants to kind of encompass and to encircle different scales and connections. This was the architectural model that is an extract of the large urban configuration, but seeks its own architecture in it. This is the narrative of the image that basically exactly examines this connection of what public domain and the public space does as an idea of passage, as an idea of connection. And it's the plan that actually uh, allows you to organize it in a very disciplined way between the private domains and the public uh, domain. So it is basically like a shortcut and um, I would wonder how, of course, you as teacher experiences, but every year we teach in Mendrisio, um, my impression also in the context of the requirements that we have to fulfill is that the, the design period is almost getting shorter and shorter and shorter. You know, it's like we're dealing only with a 10 weeks uh, cycle, so to speak, and with these this distillated three uh, methodology, uh, sorry, with this distillated three techniques of the model of the plan and uh, the image, we, we very quickly on a fragmentary base, but in a very elaborated uh, idea, can uh, perform um, an idea about the city, an idea about the architecture, and an idea about the space. Some other views. You see the object, you see this is a view from the final review. You see that images have mostly a kind of a dogmatic approach. This was a very courageous student work combining actually a Hilbersheimer condition to the neoliberal condition of Manhattan. It was the project of the German-American Institute right next to the Metropolitan, can you imagine? So it was a very provocative, of course, um, what sense of order would re result and destillated in exactly the lot that was owned by Germany in that uh, Manhattan uh, uh, mile, so to speak, of Fifth Avenue. The architecture that actually uh, became a storage house to store uh, uh, a, a, like a library or like a, to store basically the cultural exchange between Germany and the United States. The way that montage, the image, builds up the narrative between those two different regimes, so to speak, this juxtaposition of the regime uh, and the way that the drawing then uh, was concluded at the final review. You see this these techniques were extremely extra polished uh, to uh, sort of discover uh, the essence of the project um, uh, and to examining actually the methodological aspect of um, how the project has been processed. So this is not the student work, but this is our work. So I shift now to a second part uh, of the lecture. And you see, uh, hopefully, that there are some similarities, you know. So what we're trying to do is that we linking this aspect of strategy, this aspect of interest in a work to a kind of idea of a model that transcends the idea of Gestalt or that transcends the idea of what the priority is in terms of its uh, expression of architecture. For those of you that are interested, there is, there is a bilingual book uh, which has been published in Park Books. And the, the, the English title is called Silent Form and the German title is Leise Formen. So this, uh, I act, this, this aspiration to have a silent form is not that it's either mute or loud, but it's, it's of course something which is maybe a kind of a pre-architectural expression. So it underlines or is an underlayer of where an architecture could actually go to. 
And in 2008, so almost 10 years ago, we had the opportunity to exactly examining this methodology with our first project abroad, uh, which was the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. The Heinrich Böll Foundation is the political foundation of the Green Party in Germany. And what we did at the time, at the competition, we developed a montage, an image that combined the Seagram building with the Farnsworth house. Yeah? And by doing the combination of this, of course it was a mutual consent because it was the same architect, but it was a fundamental difference of architecture within the same building. The Farnsworth building as an expensive building and um, the Farnsworth building as a lyric expression of space, cantilevering, and then juxtaposed to a condition of extreme repetition, economy, uh, rules, uh, grids, etc., etc. And um, the the context was that as young architects, we had almost the, one of the first uh, uh, opportunities to build abroad. I mean, we have only, we had at the time only built one building in Switzerland, and it was seven thousand five hundred square meters, and it had a budget of ten million for Swiss. Imagination, there was a kind of triple factor missing for this building. And we didn't really understand how to cope with this kind of very drastic expression of uh, lack of budget. And this we transcend, this became the model. So a model that sort of accentuated uh, a unique architecture that's being embedded into a kind of very repetitive architecture. And you see that by doing it, it becomes a kind of an idea of prioritization, but it is also an idea of hybridization. You need the one in order to do the other. You could also say, we need to have the quantity to save money, to know where to spend it. So this antagonism, we, we thought that this was a kind of a very good uh, 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 strategy and later we found out that it had a link to our own methodology and this is exactly maybe a good example uh, to explain what this is. So this is exactly the same model like that, this is the architecture and this is the mathematics of it. And it means that we combined very little points of red extreme expensiveness with very a lot of green points of extreme cheapness. Yeah? So in the building there was basically no average, only brutal contrast. Extreme expensive element one had to be juxtaposed by 200 extremely cheap ones. And we found that what normally is so common in architecture, what is being expressed with mainstream or normality or standard, is the red line. And this is where you have to meet the cost. Yeah? And so what we try to make a polar model, just to push it and never to meet, so to speak, uh, that red line. So now you understand in this cut of the building, everything which is there occurs only once. And in the rest of the building, everything of the building is being organized through ideas of large repetition. This is how we built a building that cost 10 million. Yeah? And this is, uh, was an experience that now a strategic approach to architecture that is linked to a prioritization needs its own methodology to, in order to discover and to design. And now you see this is maybe another pivotal relationship to what we're trying to do with our students. Now this was the plan, the expensive plan. This is the cheap plan. And this is where uh, the politicians like to be. Guess where? It's of course the expensive space. Now, 
I'm, I'm going to go through some of the body of our work, but I'm stressing this again, this methodology aspect in it, it and not necessarily the deepening of the architectural expression, because I was also aware that there will be another uh, uh, lecture next Monday, which gives us or me the opportunity also to deepening the architecture in it. So this was a similar project. This was a master plan by the city. It is not our model, but it's the master plan by the city. This is nowadays also in Zurich very fashionable. The city makes a master plan. Architecture uh, can be done by the architects. So don't think about the city, only do the architecture. And what it used, what it should be was the kind of request for one of those global headquarters. And in Madrid is a fantastic example also how uh, very famous big banks migrate after 20 years. They need another headquarter and then they go from a great building to a next great building. So this is the same process or the same procedure where every time a global consultancy firm grows till the point that they need a new headquarter. And what is a headquarter? We found the program extremely boring because everything was defined, everything. A vice director gets a room, has a secretary, even how many plotters, everything, everything is defined. Nothing to explore than productivity of space, which is, let's say, a discipline of the plan, but is not related to invention. And uh, there was only basically a little hint in the program that the only thing that the corporate world wasn't really sure about it was where and how their meeting center should be and how it should be organized. And we found that very interesting because that was about 10% of the project, of the whole program. And we tried to use the meeting center on the foot of this high rise and try to sort of erode this as a kind of a complementary architecture. You could say we try to do with 10% uh, such a dominant impact that we were not related on the 90%. So there is a, a condition of different approaches, two different architectures that relate, but they merge and form a new common singularity, like the exercise of our student. This was the meeting center. This was the office. And of course, you put it together, you fuse it, and you basically observe what it kind of delivers as an architectural ingenuity of voids, of exclusions, of exceptions, so to speak, of something which you can call a great regularity. So you see this parallel condition the expression of those voided spaces and the expression of the facade, which kind of reminded wow. us to a kind of almost equalizer that sort of invades the classic expression of the corporate world, so to speak, the, uh, the typecasted or the um, uh, preconceived condition of office. Now, as we go to Berlin back years later, almost 10 years, we have been invited to uh, a very uh, particular competition, uh, and it was the headquarter of the very leftish newspaper of Berlin. It's called the Taz, Taz die Tageszeitung. And this was the shot we made from the first visit, and it was a huge mess. You can, you, we were in a way paralyzed by the way that the entire agency or newspaper actually worked. And we proposed at the time within this kind of development of the competition an idea that, um, that uh, the entire perimeter uh, would become a structure in a way that uh, the structure would also stiff out the building so that the internal condition could be completely emptied. And we did this because 
at the opening or at the beginning or at the kickoff of the competition, the head of the newspaper said like they had no clue how media is going to evolve and they had no idea how uh, actually the newspaper was going to uh, develop over the long run, but they knew that they want to uh, sort of concentrate all their activity in that building. So we designed a building that was uh, uh, focusing only on this marginal condition of the edge between inside and outside. We designed the building basically as a diaphragma uh, that uh, stabilized and used uh, the edge to organize a span of 14 meters uh, spatial depth. You see here the structural model. In order to allow all the messes, all the, the uh, uh, unpredictabilities uh, to, to, to happen actually in the building. And this was an, uh, the, an, the, the kind of resulting plan of uh, uh, this uh, media agency where basically uh, you had uh, enormous depth in the plan, you had different um, wings uh, 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 in the building and the central core uh, that was uh, uh, avoid uh, to um, organize the light. This became the architecture. It is a kind of a diaphragm. It's a kind of a concentration between that the structural engineer and the architect meet through their making basically this edge. It's a very recent images. The building will be finished hopefully next week. Uh, in Berlin, this is the ground level. And the expression of the architecture is more an architecture of, that, that uses this infrastructural condition or this, uses this framework uh, of emptiness, so to speak, inside to be filled, occupied, and uh, organized by uh, someone else. This, you see, it like, has a kind of a warehouse character, large open uh, uh, workshop spaces and the way that the building sits in the city. So we, we, we concluded also here that the, it was a kind of a success that we could work through this um, uh, methodological aspect in it uh, to say something is very important and maybe something else is not important or something is important that architects design and something is maybe much more relevant that the owner actually discovers it and uh, formulates for itself. This project, and you see we're pivoting a lot uh, between Zurich and Berlin, this project is a very emotional one because it is the first time that we've been exposed um, not to a client, but to a circle of architects. This is the project of the new Werkbundsiedlung in Berlin, and you remind maybe that 1921, the Werkbundsiedlung in Stuttgart, where Mies van der Rohe made a design, a master plan, Corbusier uh, built a very prominent building, J.P. Out made a beautiful row houses. This idea about Siedlung get changed, and the title of 100 years later was Werkbundstadt, and the Werkbund Berlin invited 35 architects to conclude on a plan and to do an architecture together. And it was quite a challenge. Uh, this was, uh, these were the architects. This is my brother, the one. Uh, so. And this is my teacher, you know, so Hans Kolhoff. So um, there was a kind of very interesting meeting between teacher and former student working together on one project. So it's also a kind of pivotal relationship that you rediscover your teacher, so to speak, as a partner on the level of a master plan and on the level of an architectural expression. And of course there was a master plan, but I, I'm, I'm trying to make another point here. And, and I, I, I thought that uh, housing is such a, let's say, uh, not only a very relevant issue, but of course a very tough issue to really work also on a very conceptual base. We proposed a geometry, we proposed a model of interest now that works with always the same space. 
And it is a model where every room is 20 square meter. And now you have a three-piece apartment with 60 square meter, you have a four-piece apartment with 80 square meter, etc., etc. And the interesting fact of it is that you could combine these spaces in any direction. And it uh, brought back a kind of a very strong architectural, let's say almost a Baroque idea of enfilade, which is a architecture that is disconnected from the imminent, directly preconceived use of its surface. So you can say this architecture, you can say like I can put the piano in, I can put four beds for my children in, or I can put anything I want in, and this makes the building an urban, uh, an urban project, a project that has a great sense of vitality because everyone of the society could use it in different ways, mix it up, and in different uh, constellations. So we were interested basically to get this model done also in a kind of circumstance of housing, because housing still links very much to this modernist idea of minimal, where you have a living, where you can live, where you have a, um, a sleeping room, where you can sleep, but it's very hard to actually interchange or to do the living in the sleeping room and vice versa. This project basically is or works exactly with the same methodology uh, to uh, erode maybe a, a kind of a normality to the explore the, the, the possibility of equal spaces and therefore uh, turn it into a kind of architectural and urban language of, of, uh, of the projects. This is a public school which is under construction and it also uh, is a very delicate question because there are two existing schools and in the middle is our extension. And it's very, it's, it, it is a national heritage so we have to be very careful. And we proposed a very flat volume that has a kind of a very uh, particular roof, not only because we thought the roof was working well with the neighborhoods, with this uh, pitch roof condition, but because the school was a hybrid in its structure. It was a school that was built on top of a gym room. And the gym room basically was sunk into the ground. The result was that there was a complex structure spanning the gym and then only one layer on top of it for the entire school. And that produced a very deep plan. And the deep plan asked for these uh, different sheds and different relationships of uh, uh, roof lighting and uh, it was embedded into a kind of a very strong expression of the facade, of the primary facade of the school. And this was the lighting concept, so you see that the lighting uh, was basically facilitating the deep plan, so the roof organized basically or was a, a tool to organize a different plan. And you see how it works? It's a two-way uh, direction, so you see the one skylight for the classroom, the other skylight basically for the aisle. And this you see now in the section, how the sections are uh, now mutating. This is almost the vernacular or the pitch uh, regularity. Then it actually moves into the skylight of the aisle. It kind of reacts as a skylight into the classroom and it kind of concludes it into these pivoting uh, 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 pitch roofs, producing a, 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 a perpendicularly rotated classroom, so a deep plan, so to speak, from lit from two sides, and an aisle that profits from this negative or from that other side of the skylight. So we could this evolve, in a way, an architecture that can or could be done only because of its particular moment of fusion to build the school on top of a gym room. So this is the long section. You see this relation. You see how uh, the structure actually works for two ways. So the, the, the structural layer on ground level becomes the skylight of the hall. 
you see this is the gym room. So this is all, like maybe you have seen many gym rooms like this, but uh, the fact is like that this becomes almost the pre preconceived condition to explore somewhere else. And this was the plan that we have uh, developed, so a kind of very deep plan of the classrooms uh, uh, organizing a very strong rhythm in the plan. Ground level, gym room. You see that constraint, and this is a good example that comes up, is a opportunity. So what we have learned, I started our, like, the, the, this lecture, that from our teacher we have learned to make a cohesion in our project. And the question now that my generation is being exposed to is that we have to marry or combine things that originally you would not necessarily marry. You know, it's like there's a gym room and there's a class, and the moment you fuse, it kind of creates opportunity. For housing, this project basically, or this procedure, was always a very difficult one for us. Because, as I said, at the Werkbund, uh, um, we, we thought that housing was still one of the last bastions of total design, of a total conceive conceivement uh, by the architects. This project was uh, um, um, exposed in a, in a park, and we had uh, three-sided extreme noise. In Switzerland, it's forbidden to build a housing project with an exposed noise pattern of uh, higher than 75 dBA on your facade. You are not allowed to build it. Unless you create a possibility of ventilation that allows you to really do a project and uh, organize basically a ventilation on a calm side. And what we have done is we developed a kind of a zigzag that in its line is almost 150% of the straight line. So what, what we would do is we made a very expensive intervention. We made a long facade that is longer than it used to be. And while we, or why, uh, because we did it, we have more surface to ventilate. And what this delivers, I found very interesting because it delivers a housing that can be developed through its specificity of site and context and can create a kind of a very stable condition. Um, this is the expression. But it, it generates a very dense, a very uh, 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 tight uh, uh, balcony structure on the inside. So the constraint allows you to actually introduce a new liberty of architecture. If the noise pattern would not be there, I could not design this because it, has, it would have been straightened out by all the clients that we would have. So there is a kind of almost an opportunistic relationship in the methodology of the design to use the constraint for the sake of the architecture that can arise. So you see the top view, this proximity, and the particular condition of the plan that negotiates the orthogonal beginning of the outer facade and the kind of directed condition to the inner core that allows to ventilate and that allows to geometrize an architecture, an apartment that almost like an écriture automatique puts the architecture in relation to that discovery, to that sort of strategic aspect in it. You see how the, the houses are, or the apartments are basically organized, like all the time the sleeping and the living is ventilated towards the calm side. And it produces its own particular uh, particularity in it, its own density, its own expression of architecture, its own sense of repetition, its own sense of uh, housing regularity. So this is the last project that I'm, I would like to show, which is also a very young project, and it's also stressing the methodology of it. This is the national television. And there was a master plan by a, a well-known colleague of us designed, and the project was this. Now, we mapped the condition of television, and there was really an interesting discovery for us. 
And you see it on this entire sort of timeline, you know, 1920, first television sets in the US, in the 40s, the first remote control, the 60 TV audiences, LCD green in the 90s, 2007, Steve Jobs, Cupertino, introduction of iPhone. A big change to the media. To, uh, 2016, the Olympic Games in uh, Rio, the coverage, the average of Swiss audiences looked uh, the Olympic Games uh, on their iPhone. 60% of all coverages were seen through iPhones. What is a television? This was it. This is it. And it doesn't mean that the future has no collective dimension, but there is a kind of fusion between the individual and the collective at the same time. You can say what used to be the studio and the bureaucracy of a national broadcasting company busted into full of soap bubbles. Studios could be 10 square meters. Uh, broadcasting companies could be five uh, square meters. How to rule it? So we got very much reminded to the expression of the Tuts, and we got very much reminded to this idea how to open up, basically, a system. This was the structure. This was our methodology, methodology model, so to speak. Three layers, 32 meter spans, very large uh, structures in uh, hardly any uh, preconceived conditions. This was the plan. So uh, you see here, uh, no structure along, then a middle section, this was 32 meters, both sides lit. So basically only an offer on surfaces that got and could be exploited in any direction with any regime of flexibility and relation and, and, and uh, a potential program. And you see, you immediately recognize these media buildings with huge slabs and big halo core elements. And this was the architecture, kind of an architecture that tried to kind of uh, align these this, uh, long slabs, open, empty spaces. Just this kind of tilting of the two regimes of the big space frames meeting uh, the space. The staircase actually uh, as a meeting point, as a, as a place to connect, to relate, to use, to explore. And this killed the project. And maybe you recognize, it was a very small news on BBC, and it was a very interesting documentary um, on, uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, it was just a small kit in the background that entered actually the space of the report of that journalist. And it was the end of the architectural frame and the project got canceled. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Pete. It was amazingly interesting what you showed us today, and I think it was clearly in the line of what we were expecting. Yo creo que ha sido una intervención fantástica en el sentido de lo que estábamos buscando, ¿no? Una, un vínculo claro entre, entre eh, las búsquedas en lo que se llama academia, ¿no? Que nosotros llamamos la escuela, y, y la práctica profesional que en tu caso... Eh, claramente ha ido eh, fuertemente vinculada ¿no? a lo que planteabais. Abrimos un momento de conversación. We, we open a moment of conversation, some questions or comments, maybe even some uh, doubts about what has been uh, shown, which would be also interesting. Uh, so please, uh, now we open up uh, the questions if any wants to. A 
very short one. You, you talk about uh, constraints that is part of your work and part of your work in the academia, which is uh, to talk about restrictions and how to, to focus in one uh, direction that is very, uh, very fixed by you. And for me, it's really strange to see the whole lecture or, or, or the 90% of the lecture without color. So what about without color? Color. Color. Color like these things. Uh, what about color in terms of uh, the architectural uh, conditions of the color? Because it's related with the materiality, etc. So, so you are uh, taking apart this area of the architecture, but in your proposals at the end, when you are uh, producing architecture, you are using color. So, what about the color in these buff fields? It's very good. It's a very good question because. If you talk about strategy, and if you talk about, um, let's say, this uh, anti-linguistic architectural expressions of a strategy model that is the form of your tactics, so to speak, we eliminate the aspect of material in it. Yeah? Because we don't want to fall in love, we don't want to be seduced, we want to be extremely cold-blooded. Yeah? because we don't uh, find it otherwise, um, uh, or we don't meet it, so to speak, on that uh, strategic level anymore. And I fully agree that since this is about this pivoting relationship that, uh, uh, where we examining the methodology of this relation, how we can evolve um, the... the uh, relation of two things, how things come together. Um, the materiality of the project is a next step. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a step that uh, uh, sort of is a work towards the realization of the project, but it's not linked to, let's say, the strategy of the project. And that's why we refrain simply from coloring or seducing or trying to go through the phenomena of materiality into the space. There are great teachers in Mendricio that teach this, and this would be then within the curriculum possible, but you won't get it in our class, you know, because we were interested, or we are interested in a kind of a different subject uh, of it. And that's, that's the, the main issue about it. I'm really curious what you say on Monday, because on Monday we talk about really the making of architecture in the sense of its materiality. That's why uh, I have to postpone the definite answer on it. Yeah, yeah but, but you promised anyway to be there, so I'm, uh, I'm, kind, I'm still kind of confident we, on that matter. We can call that auto-promotion, no? <laughs> like self... Uh, Publicity. Ok, ¿any more? No, hay, hay una cuestión que yo lanzo y seguimos con otras preguntas, pero creo que era muy interesante y es eh, que hemos visto que los planteamientos docentes eh, pasaban como de, de lo, del mundo del arte a la ciudad. ¿no? You, you, you were talking about art on, on one side and city on the other side, on your proposals for the students. ¿no? I think that proposals in, uh, within the city, which were very much uh, linked to the actual professional and, and uh, uh, disciplinary uh, approach no? um, are not so normal always. No? You w we were talking about that before, the fact that in Mendricio, for, for example, there are many uh, proposals about working in like, wonderful places or in the desert or in, a, in imaginary situations, but this linked to the real city in your proposals is something that probably is not always uh, what we are doing, uh, in, even in our studio uh, classes. No, so how how that uh, I think there is a there is something about uh, uh, I mean a, a thought about how can uh, the search in academia can be uh, directly related to these uh, difficulties of the city that you were founding that the, that were not uh, addressed by city planners, etc., uh, and that you were trying to link with that uh, uh, in, in cities in which you are working or living, like Zurich or Berlin or probably New York. You know? 
I think that that is a is something um, which is not so normal no? in our uh, school also. Maybe maybe let me react on, in two ways on this uh, remark. Um, I think that the the context we deliver for the studio is always an urban context. Yeah, we want to deal with the city, and the studio wants to develop answers to, to quests of how the city can evolve. So we, 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 we don't give out a context outside of a city or without an urban uh, issue. This, this maybe I haven't really stressed or I haven't really underlined so much in the lecture. But what, what we uh, see is, and I hope that you have discovered that, is that since our methodology works with constraint in the practice, in practicing, the student and in a university, we use not constraint, but actually uh, a artistic relation of it to, to tackle that. You know, we, we don't, that's why I said we don't want to make a pseudo practice. We don't give out quasi constraints how to solve it, but in the student actually studies the combinations, studies possibilities of how I can organize a form and relate it to another. They work much more proactively in the sense of a hybrid, you know, and they don't have to find an answer that this would deliver an added value to that and that and that. This is what happens later when they are doing architecture at practice. But that's why I'm saying, so it's the context of the city in, the, in academia, and it's a context of trying to use artistic expressions of different conditions to, to bring together as an answer to bring back to the city. And the pivot in practice is actually to respond to discrepancy, to, to constrain itself, you know. So this is maybe a shift of of reality versus the ideal condition we're trying to test or to, to, to secure, so to speak, in, in academia. Um, I miss one point, thank you for your lecture, um, which is, uh, where the idea of hybridization came from, and because um, it is clear that it generates a lot of uh, possibilities and the results are really, really interesting, but uh, it has been a research to answer at which um, problem, which question that is now to the city. I miss, I miss it, this, uh, this starting point, if you can. Um, clarify it? Well, I mean, the starting point is the experience in both. This is the dual experience. You know? The starting point is to realize that we have not been asked anymore as architects to think about one morphology anymore. You know, they want to have ten things at the same time. You know, this is a contemporary condition. This erodes the idea of cohesion. This is what I wanted to say. If you import this into the academic world, um, uh, we, we make exercises that could deliver new approaches for that. But what we try to exclude in this discussion is that the student don't have, don't have to kind of respond on this idea of uh, the way we experience this in practice. You know, there is a transition from the discovery in practice to the methodology in the academics. Otherwise, you suffer or you risk that you organize a teaching as a pseudo practice. You, you understand that? So you, you, do, you don't want to do that. You, know? you want to give the students a liberty to explore a condition that they later can relate to a context. And they don't have to, they don't have to tell me why a, a combination of high rise and market is better than uh, uh, something else. You see what I mean? I'm not the investor. I'm not playing it. You know, I leave it to them. And the discovery of us, we we can carry that out. I said that maybe also that it's it's actio e reactio. You know, so you want to have both as a teacher. You want to teach but learn as well. You know, 
as the, the many actually students have the same relation or the same pivot condition to have something to give to the studio, but also to learn something from the studio. So it's a, it's a kind of a double-sided sword, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I found interesting that, that you mentioned that your master at the university was Hans Koldoff. Uh, so I wondered if there's any uh, continuity between the way you were taught at the university and the way you're teaching project design right now. Is there any continuity or is that disruption from trauma or... Uh, no. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question because it's a kind of a heraldic question, you know. It's like, uh, it's, uh, I wasn't expecting that, but it's very, I... I, I think that, you know, we, we, we started under Hans Koloff the moment where he um, built um, the Kaisen Borneo in, in uh, Amsterdam, which I think in the end became one of the strongest brick buildings in the Netherlands, built by a German. Uh, so let's say uh, it was a period where the introduction to architecture was related to exercise, where exercise, number one, or ex the experience of exercise was not be asked to be literally taken over to ar with architecture, but was open up topics, individual topics for you to search, to discover, to understand, to break the repertoire of your own knowledge, you know, because because otherwise you become a, a prisoner of your own repertoire, you know? It's like if you always do what you know you do, you, you can't discover, yeah? So, and Hans understood is in a very f fantastic way to break repertoire of his students. And by doing it, he allowed us to open up a discovery, but later he forced us to, to do it, it in his architecture, you understand? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you could say he still forced us in this cohesiveness of his regime, yeah? I mean, uh, I don't think that it was a problem for me, you know? <laughs> but I experienced it in a way also quite limiting because I could not go on with certain discoveries, so to speak, you know. But I, I would say it has a continual relation because we've been formed by a very, very strong um, uh, personality that, that was totally convinced uh, uh, that the discovery was your thing, the architecture was his, his thing, you know. And, 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 and I think that my generation has really severely suffered a shift in the discipline of architecture. Although in Switzerland we are very comfortable still in comparison with others. But the way architecture is being produced, architecture is being influenced, architecture being sabotaged is completely different today than at the time where Hans Koloff could make this building in Amsterdam. And that's, for me, a sign that methodology has to evolve, has to go on. But of course, it's a relation of continuity in that sense, to, to carry it to the next level of it. But there was always fun and pain in his class. Yeah? It was part of the game. And I learned a lot from it. Any more questions? I think it's very clear now. No? <laughs> Perfect. On Monday, more questions, no? Yes, yes. Thank you, Pete. Thank you.